Well, let's get into our series this morning. Uh, it's entitled Big Dummies of the Bible. This is number two. And we're looking at a couple this morning, Ananias and Sapphira. And this is found in Acts 5, verses 1 to 10. So if you have your Bibles or your Bible app, turn with me to that particular area. Are we on, Jonathan? Gregory? Okay, thank you, sir. But before we get into the actual story of this couple, we need to kind of do a little background info here. We need to kind of look at the verses before that. And um, I, I finally have my illustrations this Sunday. Last Sunday, I didn't have them. And we had all these wonderful kids to experience it. Now we just have all the big kids here to experience it. So that's fine. We're still going to go through it. We've still got some good stuff. And there's also a devotional at the round table underneath the TV in the foyer there. If you would like to have a devotional for the week to go through with family or just for your own sake, they're there available to you. So let's look at Acts 4, verses 32 to 37. It says, all the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's great blessing was upon them all. There were no needy people among them, because those who owned land or houses would sell them, and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. For instance, there was Joseph, the one who the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi, and he came from the island of Cyprus. He sold the field he owned, and he brought the money to the apostles. So that's where that chapter ends. And this is where our story begins. So chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. But there was a certain man named Ananias, who with his wife, Sapphira, sold some property. He brought part of the money to the apostles. So they, they had this, this idea. You could, you could tell they had an idea because why? Light bulbs. Did they have light bulbs back then? No. Should be torches or a candle or a lamp. A little, but anyway. So they sold the property. And they brought part of the money to the apostles, claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, Ananias kept the rest. Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit, and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not to sell, as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do such a thing like this? You weren't lying to us but to God. And as soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Now you can tell he's dead. Why? Because he's got the little X in his eyes. That's how you know. That's the, this cartoon way of telling everyone he's dead. Everyone who heard about it was terrified. Then some young men got up, wrapped him in a sheet, and took him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, Was this the price you and your husband received for your land? Yes, she replied, that was the price. And Peter said, How could the two of you even think conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this? 
The young men who buried your husband are just outside the door, and they will carry you out too. Instantly, she fell to the floor and died. When the young man came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who had heard what had happened. That's the end of the story. That's the end of Ananias and Sapphira. Now, the obvious question here is, again, why? Why would God kill two people for lying? You know, part of the thing that they did was good. You know, they, they gave some money to the church to do with whatever their church wanted. Why? That's pretty harsh. I remember hearing this story as a child and kind of going, man, that's, that's harsh. That's tough. Now, there are some that speculate that these two deaths were from natural causes. Perhaps Ananias died from shock or guilt, but Peter pronounced Sapphira's death before she died even, and the coincidental timing and places of their deaths indicate that this was indeed God's judgment. Now, God's reason for bringing about the deaths of Ananias and Sapphira, I believe, are threefold. It involves God's hatred of sin, the hypocrisy or double standard of the couple, and it also, it serves as a lesson for the church, both then and now. Let's look at them a little more intently. Reason number one, God hates sin, and that isn't changing. It can be really easy today to gloss over the holiness of God. And what does the word holy mean? Anybody know? You want to venture a guess? Set apart. Set apart. Jan's nailed it right there. Yes. It means set apart. We are to be different. We have a different standard. We are to be holy, set apart, as God is holy, set apart. We're not supposed to do things the same way as the world does. We're supposed to be set apart. And it's very easy for us to forget that God is a holy God that he is righteous, that he is pure, and that he hates sin wholeheartedly. This particular sin of hypocrisy, saying one thing and doing another, deceiving, that deceitfulness in the church had to be dealt with swiftly and decisively. 1 Peter 1.16, and Peter is is the one who's in this story. He's the one that talked to both Ananias and Sapphira. So he says this, for the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. It had to be dealt with, and it had to be dealt with quickly. This is the start of the first church. And you can't, get, you, you can't start something and, and stumble out of the gate. You couldn't have that in the early church, in the beginning of everything. If you look at the beginning of everything that God is trying to do, take, take the, the beginning of Adam and Eve, the start of the human race. They blew it. Were they allowed to stay in the garden? No. God forgave them. He provided for them. But that was it. You know, out of the pool. <laughs> You know, you can't be in the garden anymore. It's not going to come easy to you. You're going to have to now work for a living. You're going to have to toil. And he prevented them from going back into the garden. He had to deal with it. Another question that comes up along these lines is, were Ananias and Sapphira actually saved? Well, we believe they probably were. Most scholars, um, myself included, I wouldn't consider myself a scholar, but um, by looking at it and the context of this, the scripture, the story isn't told in, in this way. It says all the believers, all the believers. 
and that's in Acts 4.32. They knew of the Holy Spirit, Acts 5.3, and Ananias' lie could have been an earlier promise that he would give the whole amount of the sale to the Lord. But the best evidence that they were children of God may be that they received God's discipline. If God doesn't discipline you as he does all of his children, it means that you are illegitimate and are not really his children at all. Where is that found? You know, Al? Do you remember? Yeah. Hebrews 12. Yeah, Hebrews 12, 8. And also in 1 Corinthians 5, 12, it says, It isn't my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church who are sinning. Ananias and his wife had conspired to garner the acolytes of the church, but their conspiracy led to their downfall and eventual death. So God hates sin, and that isn't changing. He's the same as he was yesterday, today, forever. And you couldn't have that at the start of the early church. There's just no way. You couldn't have a start like that. So God had to deal with it. Reason number two, you can be sure that your sin will find you out. Oops, sorry. That's Numbers 32, 23. No sin will ever go unpunished. You're either going to pay for the price here on earth, or you're going to pay for the price later on in the afterlife. In the case of Ananias and Sapphira, it also illustrates the fact that even believers can be led into bold, flagrant sin. We're not untouchable. We're not. As much as we think we are, and that we'll never, ever do that, careful where you stand, lest you fall. It was Satan that filled their hearts to lie in this way. Acts 5, 3 says, and to test the spirit of the Lord. That's in verse 9. You have covetedness. You have hypocrisy. You have a desire for the praise of men rather than the praise of God. Those things all played a part in their demise. Reason number three. Oop, wow, I'm going the wrong way here. There you go. This event serves as a warning both then and now. The sudden dramatic deaths of Ananias and Sapphira serve to purify and warn the church. It says great fear gripped the entire church. Right away in the church's infancy, God made it plain that hypocrisy, dishonesty, they weren't going to be tolerated. Ananias and Sapphira help guard the church against similar incidences in the future. God laid the bodies of Ananias and Sapphira in the path of every hypocrite who would seek to tarnish the church's reputation. Along that same point, the case involving Ananias and Sapphira helped establish the apostles' authority in the church. The sinners had fallen dead at Peter's feet. And it was Peter who, through the power of the Holy Spirit, had known about their secret sin and had the authority to pronounce judgment in the church. Jesus said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. That's in Matthew 6, 19. If the hypocrisy of Ananias and Sapphira had succeeded in fooling Peter, it would have severely damaged the church and the apostles' authority. And subsequently, they would have been in a mess right from the start. The sad story of Ananias and Sapphira, and it is sad, is not some obscure incident from the Old Testament regarding a violation of the law of Moses. Instead, this occurred in the first century church to believers in Jesus Christ. And their story is a reminder to us today that God sees our hearts. 1 Samuel 16, 7, right? Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. 
He hates sin. And he's concerned for the purity of his church. His bride is to be spotless. 1 Corinthians 11, 1 John 5, those are all verses regarding that. As Jesus told the compromising church in Thyatira, all the churches will know that I am the one who searches out the thoughts and the intentions of every person, and I will give to each of you whatever you deserve. Revelations 2.23. So we have a few things here. In terms of dumb decisions, well, dumb decision number one with Ananias and Sapphira, and dumb decision for us as well, because sometimes... We fall into this. They stopped focusing on God and started looking at everybody else. Once you start taking that focus off of God, you're in trouble. And that was the case way back, way, way back. If we go right down to the original point of sin, Eve took the focus off of God She wanted to be like God. And she looked at the fruit and, wow, that was appealing. And we're going to to get to a message down the road. Uh, We're looking at at three main things, the silent killers, I like to call them. And uh, we'll, we'll study that in more depth down the road. But the focus was taken off of God and the focus was placed on them. Instead of looking good in the eyes of God, they wanted to be looked good. They wanted to be looking good in the eyes of everybody else. You had pride that creeped up. You had jealousy. Maybe they were jealous about Barnabas and all the attention that he got and and for what he did. And you had fame. All played a part into it. All had something to do with it. Philippians 2.3 says, Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourselves. You know, it's... I don't think people come into things just going, hey, you know what? I I think I'm just going to go out there and impress others. I think it's a gradual thing. It's a bit of a slippery slope. I think our intentions sometimes are are right and honorable, just just like them. They had the property. They did give some money to the church. The way in which they did it was wrong. It was deceitful. Their intentions, in part, were good to give money to the church. That's okay. And I think sometimes our intentions are good too. We do stuff because we want to benefit the church. You know, we want to help out the church. But sometimes we're doing it so that we look good to others in the church. Hey, look at me. Look what I'm doing for the church. Hey, look at all the volunteer hours that I'm doing. Hey, look at all the things that I'm doing for the community, et cetera, et cetera. Hey, that's not what it's supposed to be about. And again, I applaud this church. There's so many things that we do for the community, but we're not bragging about it. We're not getting attention in the paper about it. Hey, we gave X number of dollars to to this, to that, to the other thing. No, we don't do that. Because we know that's, that's not what this is about. In fact, we try to do it almost anonymously as much as we possibly can. but we're tempted to, right? And I love the fact that God loves to keep me humble because there are a lot of times where I'm I'm trying to impress and I'm trying to do something and then, you know, tech goes on me or this goes on me or this happens or that happens and it's just like, last Sunday, I didn't have my illustrations. I'm like, thank you for keeping me humble, Lord. (laughs) You know, Um, it's all good. We need it. I need it. These are lessons that we all have to learn. 
Dumb decision number two. They decided to start taking life into their own hands. And how many times do we do that? Psalm 119 verses 1 to 3 says, Joyful are people of integrity who follow the instructions of the Lord. Joyful are those who obey his laws and search for him with all their hearts. They do not compromise with evil and they walk only in his paths. Part of the problem that we have at times is we think that God needs help. I think I'll help God out. Uh, you know, because this isn't really going the way I think it should go. So we'll, we'll give God a helping hand. Does God need our help? No, he doesn't. Does God want our help? Yes, I would say he does. He wants us to get involved. He wants us to be part of working and developing and expanding his kingdom for sure. But he doesn't need our help. Uh, God can do it. And he wants to use us, but we have to be obedient to him and what he is telling us to do. You look at the case of Abraham. Hey, you know, God says he's going to make a mighty nation. He's taking too long. Maybe we should give him some help. And how did that work out? We're still paying the price for it today. So we have to be very, very careful, I think, at times. Um, not to overstep, not to get ahead of God. Allow him to work in and through us, but listen to him and not decide to take matters into our own hands. Number three, they lie to look good to everyone else. Galatians 6, 7 to 8 says, Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. Those who live only to satisfy their own sinful nature will harvest decay and death from that sinful nature. But those who live to please the Spirit will harvest everlasting life from the Spirit. Whatever you sow, that's what you're going to reap. And whenever I hear somebody complaining about, oh, you know, this, 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 and this, and this, I almost want to say to them, well, what seed are you sowing? If you don't like what you see, plant different seed. You know, if you don't like, you know, the, the grass always looks greener on the other side of the fence. Well, then plant some different seed, some grass seed on your side. Just do that. If you don't like what you're harvesting, plant some different seed. That's all there is to it. Because you're going to reap what you sow. So you might as well sow good seed. Reap the benefits. Well, because of these dumb decisions, the result is, what's the result? Illustrated by the, the dead goldfish going into the toilet. <laughs> Death. That's what it is. So don't be a dummy. Don't be foolish. Instead, we need to be like the first church. Because that's how it all started. Here's the thing. All the believers, it said. Did it say some of the believers? A few of the believers? The vast majority? No, it said all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to sharing in meals, and to prayer. Uh just this week, I got a, a phone call from Mike Mahorta. And Mike is kind of our, our fellowships guy who is um, looking after all the churches in the, in the BC Pacific Fellowship. And he, he checks in. And he was doing a check-in with me. And he goes, how's it going, Barry? Those guys driving you nuts? <laughs> no, he didn't say that. <laughs> But he, he asked, you know, how things were going. I said, you know what? You couldn't ask for a better church. You really couldn't. And when I'm looking at these things, this is what we're about here at KFBC. We're, we're all about getting into God's word. We're all about fellowship. Maybe too much, eh? 
<laughs> We're all about sharing in meals. We do that too. We're all about prayer. Those things are really important to us. This is what we strive for. This is what we go after. And it says, all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions, and they shared the money with those in need. They worshiped together at the temple each day, met in homes for the Lord's Supper. They shared their meals with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God, enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Man, that's what it's all about. This is what the church is supposed to be. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be set apart, different, different than the rest of the world. The rest of the world, it's all about me. It's all about what I get out of it. It's all about what's in it for me. And we need to be different. We need to stand out. So don't be a dummy too. Devote yourselves to the teaching of God's word. And it's not just Sunday. It's every day. It's every day. It's super easy now, nowadays, to, to have a regular devotional time. If you've got the Version Bible app, it's a great thing to have because there are tons and tons and tons of devotionals that you can choose from on every topic imaginable. And the another bonus to this app is the fact that it's, well, number one, it's free. It's a free app. You don't have to pay anything for it. Um, the other thing is with your devotionals, you can set a reminder. And so you go, hey, I, I need a reminder to have my devotions today. And your phone will go off and go, hey, have you read God's word? Have you read the verse of the day? Have you gone into your devotional plan and have you done it today? It'll remind you in case you're one of those thick-minded people like myself and you need the reminder. I have to have a smartphone because I'm not smart enough on my own. So um, it's brilliant for that. It's, it's fantastic for that. Get into God's word each day and what it teaches us. The other thing is give what you can to those in need. And we're not just talking financially. We're not just talking money-wise. Some people just need our time. Some people just need a listening ear. Some people just need a friend. There are some things that money just can't buy that people still need. So do that. Give what you can to those in need. Give with a glad and sincere heart. Ooh, why'd you have to add that one, Barry? Okay. Have you been there? Because I've been there. Okay, I'm, I'm going to give, and maybe it's monetarily speaking, and you're like, oh, man, this hurts. This hurts to give. This is hurting. Uh, but it's my duty. Uh, or God's calling you to spend time with somebody and you just don't want to. <laughs> but Lord, you don't understand this person. This person drives me crazy. This person has a yappy dog who's black and white. And <laughs> drives me up the wall. Licks my hand and legs. I'm not mentioning anybody, Glenda. Um, so, and but we we go okay. I'll do it, Lord. But you know, and I'm just tolerating this. It, does does it say that? Give with toleration. No, it says give with a glad and sincere heart. Do it because it's the right thing to do. Do it because it's bringing God joy. Do it because you're bringing that person joy. Again, it's the seed that we sow, right? You're going to reap what you sow. So if you go in there, hey, if you have to fake it until you make it, at least do that. At least do that. 
Devote yourselves to the teaching of God's word. Give what you can to those in need and give with a glad and sincere heart. That's what it's all about.